This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 63 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have sort of an East Meets West show. We have an amazing clinician, Ken McNabb, and we have Heather Moffat, who teaches uh, Enlightened Equitation. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Hello. How's Debbie? It's been forever since we chatted. Oh, my gosh. I know. I've been off to England and home again and all that. Like That's sort of like one of those fairy tale little – I'm the cat in the hat, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> and so you've been busy too, though. Oh, my gosh. You're the girl of the hour. You got the new horse. It's been rather an exciting month or so. You're right. Uh, Beaker, my longtime trail riding friend, has moved on and is, has, as Glenn put it, he's moved on to bless another family, which I thought was right. very nice of him. Um, exactly. Yes, and he, nice. he's uh, he's very happily moved on to his new family, and they are just so excited to have him. And they got who got him, family. little girl, Mom. a young a young lady who was in college, okay. and uh, she and her significant other uh, decided to get each other anniversary gifts oh. of a horse each. Wow, in yes. college, that's cool. Yes, I think I think he just graduated, and she's still finishing up. So she was very excited, and they very wisely brought their instructor along to pick out yep. their horse. Very good. And the instructor got up on Beaker and gave him a good test ride to make sure he would be appropriate for her student. And she just rode him beautifully. I felt so good about that oh. because even though he's, quote, just a trail horse, I really appreciated that someone would ride him and interact mm-hmm. with him with such respect, which was very refreshing. Perfect. Yeah, that's really nice. Are they bringing their trainer with them for a trail horse? I mean, they could have gone more casual. That's really nice. I I, I love to hear that uh, they're being responsible owners. Well, it was great because she knows where this plays into a, a future episode of Horsemanship Radio. She okay. understands where the rider's strong suits are, not just in her skill set, but also in her knowledge set, which mm, are yeah. they're two different things, what you can mm-hmm. do and what you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so she was able to assess whether or not Beaker would be a good fit for his skill set as well as his personality type. Good. Because, you yeah. know, just because you can do a flying change of lead doesn't mean the horse you're riding is going to be a good fit for you because he can do a flying lead change. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, true. There's, there's that so much more. It's a much more complex relationship than when that. It's a lot like Absolutely. dating. Yes. And uh, she decided that they were a great fit, and uh, he moved in with his new family the day before yesterday. Oh my and, gosh. N- nuptials yeah. are already done. Everything's are already done. And <laughs> and Nigel, the new horse, moved in a little earlier than I thought he would. I came across this guy. Nigel. And, yeah. So yeah. tell me about this relationship. He sounds like a superstar soccer player from the UK. Nigel. He does, doesn't he? But he, he's really shaped more like a rugby player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he is a thoroughbred, but he really takes after his Irish grandpa. He is a big, oh. sturdy Kind of, he looks almost like an Irish sport horse more so than an American thoroughbred. Big wow, body, yeah. very heavy. Uh, has a nice, quiet, laid back attitude. He's a lovely guy. Good. And the gal I got him from, uh, life, life made changes to her that she didn't choose, but there they mm-hmm. were. So he's been, he spent the past year or so figuratively sitting in his grandma's basement eating cheese puffs and playing <laughs> oh. video games. <laughs> bit of a blob, eh? Yeah, he's a bit of a blob. So <laughs> we, we have some work to do, but he's he's got the basics really, really good. He only went to second grade, but he paid attention. Oh, well, that's good. That's yes. good. I heard you said something on one of the shows, I think, about having plate for feet. He Platter. has plates for feet, yes. He's been barefoot. <laughs> and uh-huh. for some reason, his feet just turned into giant plates. Wow. They're crazy. I measured them. They huh? are... Almost seven inches across. <laughs> yeah. Oh, keep your boots out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I, well, he got my toe the other day. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we went out to the horse park to go for a ride away from home for the first time. And he something caught his attention and startled him a little bit. And he got caught my toe. And it it's 
a week and a half later, still purple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but he didn't mean it. One, an, another skill. This is the, this is the handiest skill set I've learned. When we went to bring Nigel home, the, uh, the lady who owned him, I said, you know, we can take him home today. We brought the horse trailer with us. And she said, well, you're welcome to, if you can get him in. Oh, interesting. Yes. How'd it go? <laughs> it went very well. I said, okay, I need to set aside the ego and we mm-hmm. need to do this respectfully. We need to let, let him understand that I'm here to be your leader, not cram your, him in the can, not yeah. cram him in the can. Very good. Very good. So I used those techniques to help him get in. He got right in the trailer. Okay. And we brought him home. Um, two weeks went by and we decided to go to the horse park for our first outing. And we knew that it might be interesting to get him on the horse trailer because we really hadn't fussed with it since bringing him home. Oh. And it was very interesting because the first thing he did was walk up to that ramp and give it a good sniff and then stand straight up on his hind legs. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very happy to have, as you recommended, the really, really long rope. Long line. Good. <laughs> yes. Good girl. I, I, had your, I had your voice playing in the back of my head. Oh, yeah. Whoever moves their feet first. <laughs> That's right. Right. And I think I really honestly think that made a difference because I I don't have a Monty I don't have a, a dually halter big enough for him because his head is oh, giant. That's right. We gotta get a blue. I gotta get the giant warm blood size. He has a giant okay. head. Uh so I just put a piece of smooth, thick about the same d- thickness of rope across the nose so I could kind of mimic it. Okay. Do do the best I could because I knew a regular yeah. halter wasn't going to cut it. And I yeah. was not going to put a chain on his nose. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I don't think this horse has ever been handled that way. And I'm not going to start now. Yeah. Let's start a fight. Don't sure. start a fight. You never start, <laughs> you never start a fight with a storm cat child. That's right. uh, the storm cat grandson. So I'm not going there. Um, so I, I let, okay, you're going to rear. You needed to get that out of your system. You reared. So That's we right. collected the lead rope back up and I, I went through the same process. I let him let him up to the ramp and then we backed up and we let him up to the ramp. And then I, I moved him around in the area where the horse trailer was and tried to find places where he might not want to go Mm -hmm. that weren't the horse trailer and let him try to stop and bulk. Cause he's, he's kind of prone to when he's on the lead rope. If he doesn't want to go anywhere, he just stops. Mm -hmm. That's his thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're stopping and you're going to fight, feel that pressure on your pseudo dually halter yeah. And as you start to relax and come forward towards it, it's going to go away. And he figured mm-hmm. that out in very short order. And mm-hmm. it was very low key, kept the adrenaline down. Oh, good. He's smart. That's he's he's a very smart horse. And he, half an hour later, he was happily walking onto the horse trailer. Good. We got in and out several times before we closed it up. And then on the way home, two tries, walked up onto the horse trailer happily, quietly, no heavy breathing, no sweating. Good. It was yeah, all so, very so copacetic. He's, he's okay on the ride and everything too. Yes. So good. yeah, once he's in, he seemed to be fine. Good. And the the previous owner said that mm, he he can bullet back out of the trailer. So be careful about putting up the tailgate. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to solve that from the start. We're not going to put the tailgate up until he's comfortable getting in and out. And staying that's still. it. Yeah, that's right. You want that calm adrenaline down. Calm yep. adrenaline down. Very and, good. And once we got through that initial calm adrenaline down, nobody's picking a fight with anybody here. It was amazing how quickly he said, yes, ma'am, I'm on your page. <laughs> Great. So that is thrilled. so cool to hear. So, yeah, we have actually on the Equus Online University, we just are finishing up a series um, from the tour demonstrations and the horse is called Manda. And that's her thing. She flies back off the, the trailer, but her adrenaline was all up. She was all a flutter and everything. And, and you know what? I think honestly, her owner was really nervous. And, mm-hmm. and you know, they start to feed off that and go, there must be something scary going Absolutely. on here. Absolutely. And this guy really <laughs> does do that much more so than Beaker did because Beaker was his own man. He is so mm-hmm. confident in who he was and what he did. This fella a little bit less so. He he depends on his human for for guidance in that way. So I really work Feels hard. Feels like the big ones always do. Why Isn't is that, that funny? The giant <laughs> ones that are, you know, 1200 pounds. Yeah. So I have to work very hard at keeping my adrenaline down because I yeah. tend to get, you know, you got to do it now and you got to do it my way. Uh, yeah, so we all do. And so and people that get stuck at the shows and everything, I feel so bad for them because, you know, the horse got in, the trailer may be fine when he left the, the barn. But, yes. you know, and now you got to leave the equestrian center or the horse show and, uh, you know, yes. and everybody's tired. And, yes. and that's when that's when we got to, you know, remember breathing exercises. We got to remember, you know, yes. everybody's got to be an I adult. I have to work very carefully at the breathing. I tend to hold my breath. Yeah. Yeah. That's bad. 
Well, you know what's so fun about that though is if you t- – and I do too. If you tend to be a, a breath holder <laughs> – I didn't know there was a name. But if you tend to do that and you think of it, it's so cool because you've probably been holding it for a few minutes before you think about it. And then you go – and you watch the horse just melt. It is the coolest thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to he watch just goes, that next time. Oh, I really am. I'm yeah, you it. literally. I mean, you have to get. You have to tell yourself because you'll have to watch for for his little relaxations. But yeah. if you've been holding it, they will. They're waiting almost for that moment when you say, "No, now, now's the time," and that's your indicator for them yeah. most of the time. Yeah. And the other thing that that he's taught me already, because every time you get to know a new horse, you learn things about yourself. Um, moving. Um, I think it was Jamie was talking about this when she went to the Gentling Wild Mustangs Clinic. Moving th- you have to move as if you're moving through oil. Heavy oil. Heavy that's oil. it. And think again, of, that's think that black I, stuff. You I know, had a hard just... time getting my head around it because I I couldn't um, bring it out phys- physicality. I couldn't mm-hmm. I couldn't pretend I was a washing machine. I was having a really hard time with that. <laughs> so when I was working with Nigel, mm-hmm. and every day is a training opportunity. You know, to bring him out of the in and out of the pasture. It's the training opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a little bit of a lumbering oaf. He, he very much reminds me of a draft horse in his reactions. He's He wants to react to you and he wants to be obedient, but he tends to be physically slow to do it. Cute. <laughs> um, so he very much reminds me of a Percheron. So I'm, tr- I'm trying to move slower so that he has the opportunity to move and react the moment he understands the aid rather right. than my aid being very quick and then there's a delay, which sort of untrains the aid a little bit. Yeah. So I'm right. working on, and he's been better. He's been much better about staying at my shoulder, not walking ahead of me. He's been better about stepping away from me because he wants to crowd my space a little bit just because he doesn't feel like moving. It's too much effort. Right. <laughs> it's like, why should I move? I'm here. I'm comfortable. Um, <laughs> and moving, actually moving slowly but fluidly has made him more responsive, which was very interesting. Perfect. Per- yeah, it is interesting. And and you've been around horses your whole life. So you know that quick movements and everything are obviously going to be detrimental. But moving in oil, that does, it is actually an acquired skill that you have to consciously think of. <laughs> it, it's, the, it's, not, it's not just the opposite of quick movements. It's fluid, you know? Yes, it's, it is. It, mm-hmm. it's, it's, so, it's, it's a real, real skill set. What I was trying to liken it to what – what helped me get started with it is, and I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even know what it's called, mm-hmm. the um, martial art, for lack of a better term, that oh, folks yeah. practice. You, see, you always see them in the park and they're standing on one foot and they're doing That's strange things right. with their arms. Mm-hmm. I envisioned that. Very good. That is a good idea. Fluid, but purposeful and balanced. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So I tried to envision my physicality because everything I do with my body He's observing, and that's part of my aids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I try to bring that mindset and that balance into it. And as soon as I kind of got the knack of it, because I, I was practicing it with Scooter too, mm-hmm. it helped. Now with Scooter, who is a very quick, he's very clever, he's an alpha pony, he's all mm-hmm. pony, all those things that you associate with pony. Yeah. Moving more fluidly like that with him is interesting because my physicality sees it less as an excuse to interact because a lot of times with scooter if you move quickly with him he just sees it as a way to play lip tag oh <laughs> oh you're here to play you know it's yeah. like no not really <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cute that is so pony isn't it yeah he's so yeah. pony and it's it's helped that a little bit he's a little bit less prone to interacting at a Good, yeah. At yeah. that lip tag play goof off level, and he's more apt to just pay attention and react to the aid. So taking that skill to heart and really working hard at it all the time has made yeah. a big difference with both horses. Excellent. Great. I should add one other thing too, because I've seen people do this um, in trying to acquire that skill of fluidity or moving like you're in heavy oil, is they start to skulk. <laughs> they sort of sneak up on the horse, like, and they think that that's 
what we're asking, you know, is to kind of like, but horses like freak out at that too. Well, sure. You're, <laughs> you're know, sneaking up on them like a panther. <laughs> exactly. If you look like, like you're stalking them, that's sure. not the idea either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's all I can say is just, you know, maybe go on the Monty Roberts University and, and see what we mean about moving in, in heavy oil and really watch those, the, the gently wild horses and the gently Mustangs uh, lessons, because that's where you'll see the muscle memory is just mm-hmm. there in the instructors. They're just doing it naturally. They're not going to teach you how to do it, but watch how they do it. Observe how they do it. Mm-hmm. And you'll see what Jen and I are talking about. Now, it's a lot on, fun. on the, on the university, you mm-hmm. sign up and you get, you get your account. Is there a way to search the yes. videos and the lessons so that you can find things that will be easy and, and productive examples of that? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that, actually. Um, there is a great search mechanism. The search bar on, on your dashboard on the, on the homepage, and it's on several pages, is really good because if you put in a word like join up or if you put in biting or something like that, that's a search term now. And it breaks it the search into three categories anywhere that that word is mentioned. So it the first uh, group that comes up are all the lessons that it's mentioned in. Mm-hmm. The second group are the Q and A's, and we have hundred. Well, I think there's like six hundred Q and A's in there now, and so all the places that biting or join up comes up. And the last one is the forum, and the forum is like the, that's like a secret sauce. The forum is really cool. It's the most positive. There's never any negative in it. They all help each other. We've got certified instructors in there too. So you'll find it in all three places. But the first place I like to go is the lessons because then you're going to get the, like the foundation work mm-hmm. on it. But thanks for asking that because the search, I think the search bar is one of the strongest ones out there uh, for, for a, a, a website that has, yeah, yeah, the website has like, I think as of today, we're like 404 lessons on there. So it is unwieldy if you, you can't. And we actually just broke it into a uh, a bunch of different categories. They are groundwork foundational, groundwork problem solving, groundwork advanced. Then there's ridden foundational, ridden advanced, and ridden discipline specific. So we have Stefan Peters on there and we have uh, Will Simpson and just some of the greats uh, across disciplines. And um, Richard Winters, we're going to have on the show. And, and, um, and then the the other categories are like we have equipment management, stable management. Um, oh, cool! I didn't know you had those. Yeah, yeah they have, they're buried in there. You know, <laughs> that's cool. So you can just go into that search bar and start typing search words, and you're going to come up with all kinds of great ideas. Yeah. So I don't have skulking in there. You won't find skulking. You won't find skulking. Now, if I were to <laughs> type in heavy oil, or does it take more than one word? Uh, you know, if you put in a term like that, yeah, it'll find where those are. You just cool. have to get the term right too, yeah. but you just keep yeah. experimenting with it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you learn, you know, you crawl along and you learn all kinds of, you go into that rabbit hole, you know? Well, yeah. That's <laughs> the thing. You start, you start typing in terms and then you get, it's not it's the one fun. you're looking for, but the one you found was really awesome. It was really good. <laughs> yeah. Or next week it might be. So it's like finding yeah. a, new, a new ice cream shop. You know? That's right. Very close to that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that is all. And, well, thank you for asking about Nigel. It's, it's been a fascinating journey already, and I've had him a little bit less than a month. So well, it's going to be fun to get to know him. You and you and he and, his, and the relationship. It'll be fun to follow, Jen. Thanks for sharing all that. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's get on to, we've got some great guests coming in today. And uh, like I said, it's an East meets West show today because we've got um, one from the way in the Western world up in the mountains to a lady who's... 30 years, I think, in the uh, in the field of uh, dressage and centered riding all the way over in the UK. We have an amazing clinician, Ken McNabb, and he is on RFD TV. A lot of people will know him. And we have a, a, a lady all the way from the UK, Heather Moffat, who teaches uh, enlightened equitation, just an amazing rider. Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate, He's a Sugar Bear. (laughs) You know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. You need to find one that best suits you, your temperament and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. 
You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the risk capacity survey at ifa.com. That's IFA as an index fund advisors. Or you can call us toll free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133. Ken McNabb grew up in a traditional ranching family in the mountains of Wyoming. He always enjoyed helping others gain confidence with their horses, and he advocates using gentle methods. And his Christian faith, strong family values, and patriotism endear him to many people. Ken considers himself very fortunate to make his living horseback while helping other people realize their horsemanship dreams. Ken McNabb, his wife, Dee Dee, sons Kurt and Trent all share the love of horses. Welcome, Ken McNabb. So glad to have you on Horsemanship Radio finally. How are you? Where are you calling from today? Well, thank you, Debbie. Actually, I'm at home on the ranch in uh, north central Wyoming, just enjoying some beautiful springtime weather. Ah, that's fantastic. That's right. You have a huge, you call it a uh, powder horn ranch in Wyoming. Is that right? Well, actually, the powder horn is uh, the segment of our campus that belongs to my partner, to Deemer True. And okay. then our place is uh, up six hours north of there, right on the Montana border. Oh, beautiful area. That is a gorgeous area. Lucky you, huh? Yeah, we love it. We're very blessed, for sure. You are blessed. That's awesome. Well, we've been... Um, doing horsemanship radio for a couple of years now. And one of the things I miss the most is talking to the guys and the gals that get up in the mountains and are just untethered from, uh, you know, the city lights and all this stuff. But I know that you come off that mountain and you get around this uh, globe quite a bit, at least the United States doing clinics and things too. What's your next trip? Uh, I head out to Equine Affair in Ohio. And then uh, follow that the following weekend in Central Tennessee with another clinic. And the weekend after that, I will be uh, in Arizona for an extreme Mustang makeover. Yeah, that's right. Another one. That is awesome. I think that's where I first met you was possibly, was it Paso Robles maybe at an, uh, a makeover that was there. Does that sound familiar? That's probably uh, that or Norco, one of those in California. Or Norco. Yep, could have been that too, Ken. Well, we're really yeah, happy to yeah. have you here. I, I wanted people to get to know you a little bit because you're a huge advocate for using horses whenever you can on the trail and on the ranch. And and get rid of that four-wheeler if you can for, for as much as you can anyway. And I love that about you. What is it that makes a great ranch horse? Well, uh, I think that is what makes a great ranch horse really is, is activity and use. And, you know, um, in the world today, we, we run the wheels off of our trailers and haul our horses everywhere. And when I was a kid, which really wasn't that long ago, there really wasn't the access to trailers that there is today. And we rode every place we went. Mm-hmm. And our horses were better broke because they were they were more used. And we believe in really creating a training program to teach the horse his job, but then for him to get good at his job, just like in our military or law enforcement, they have to have practice. They have to get out there and do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I tell my crew all the time, we never get paid for turning the key in any motorized vehicle. (laughs) And uh, our ranch is one of the few left in the country. We don't own a side-by-side. We don't own a four-wheeler. We don't own a golf cart. Uh, if we need it done, we do it horseback and, um, you know, we still obviously use our trailer some, but we try really hard to keep our horses feet on the ground and our, and our butts in the saddle. And, and I think in the long run, that makes better horses because they actually have the opportunity to get out and practice what you've taught them. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And how fun is that to have a, to be paid for that as well. I think that's a great living. Absolutely. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> so do you, are you uh, a breeder? Do you breed homebreds, uh, do you, uh, your own horses, or do you typically buy we these? We do. Mm-hmm. No, both, both. Um, between my partners uh, on the Diamond Ranches and myself, we probably raise uh, between 30 and 40 foals a year. Mm. Uh, they raise more than I do. I, I tend to raise never in excess of about 10, mm-hmm. uh, foals a year on our place. And they, they run better than 20 on theirs, um, every year. And, and so we raise some, but you know, we, 
we use 100 horses a year, um, and actually that's really not quite true. Between the two ranches, we really use about 70 horses a year. And um, and then the consigners bring the rest to our sale. But we we couldn't attempt to raise enough um, to to do everything we need to do. So we buy a, a lot of horses. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we look when we do that, we look for really good, uh, reputable places to pick those horses up or, or people we know. And, and we you know, we want to find special individuals, not just any old horse. We want to find special individuals that are going to do the job we need them to do. Mm-hmm. And that is, you're mostly horse and cattle ranching, correct? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, honestly, we run beef cattle, and um, that's that's a priority for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's important to us that, uh, I, I mean, without patting yourself on the shoulder too hard, mm-hmm. uh, you like to feel good about helping to feed the world. And um, and raising beef cattle is important to us. It's It's who we are. Uh, mm-hmm. none of us, none of us would be in ranching unless we were also raising cattle, but then the horses, likewise, you know, there's a lot to be said for producing a quality colt from birth to, uh, your destination and, and being able to say, wow, you know, here, I've got a six year old horse that knows his job. He's, uh, he's been there, done that, and he's ready to go be a, a hired man on somebody else's ranch, or he's ready to go be the best trail horse this person's ever had, or he's ready to go show in the, in the ranch versatility. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of satisfaction in that. And, uh, it's, it's a job worth doing, mm-hmm. but to us, they are they're synonymous. We really don't want to do one without the other. Cool. Yeah. You, you, I think the line that you use is cattle and horses go together. So what do you look for in a good cow horse? So, you know, honestly, for me, a horse that has a great disposition but no confirmation is much better than a horse with great confirmation but no disposition. Yeah. Um, ideally, what I need is both. And so that, those are the two things we put at the top of the list. I, I want to see those two things. Then, you know, then we look at uh, bloodlines. Is this horse predisposed to work cattle? Is his is, is heritage work cattle? Um, and then, you know, then I just look at the individual himself. And I love to see things like a, a horse that'll chase a dog out of the round pen. Mm-hmm. I don't really want my horse going around killing other people's dogs or anything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but what I do want is a horse that will pin his ears and go after a dog or a chicken or anything. That shows me a horse that's going to be willing to work cattle. Yeah. And, um, you know, those are, those are traits that, that I like. And, and then, uh, you know, kind of in there with disposition, I need this horse to have a calm demeanor. Uh, I've watched a lot of sick cattle, particularly missed by people who have a horse that's stirring the herd. When I walk through the herd on my horse, I need him to walk one foot at a time and I need to be able to check through my cows without stirring them. Mm-hmm. I, I need them to, you know, if they're laying down, I want them to stay laying down. If they're standing there acting sick, I need to be able to see it. And if this horse has got his head up and his feet jigging around, he's going to wake those cattle up and have them all run in circles shortly. And I won't be able to find sick cows. So we look for that horse with that laid back, natural, quiet demeanor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love what you said. That's great. That's so good. Uh, I love what you said about no matter what the, the breeding feed that you put into these colts, that you let your horses be horses, that you put them out there in the sub-zero weather, but Hey, they, they're good stock when you have a horse that comes through your program. That's right. We have, I, and I can't prove this, but I think we have the only son of highbrow cat that was raised at 8,000 feet of elevation, loose on a 2,500 acre pasture with mountain lions and bears. And, mm-hmm. and to me, uh, he's an incredible little horse. And I love the babies that we get from him. They are great thinkers. They're great athletes. But more importantly than that, He has proved himself on the ranch. And a lot of people in today's market, and it's not all bad, but a lot of people want to see a horse prove himself in the show ring. And that's important. For sure it is. But horsemen, when I was a kid, horsemen were heard to say things like, we train great horses and we show the best of them. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with a different mindset. To me, I don't want to train show horses. I want to train great horses. Mm -hmm. And a big part of training great horses is allowing them to be a horse and to function in the element that they're designed to function in. And if they can survive up there, if, if this horse can survive 
the elements and he can thrive and learn to be an amazing adult animal. And then he pr- reproduces that same type of uh, disposition and conformation and structure and tenacity. Then I have an animal that I know, you know, to me, I, I think any cowboy's greatest fear is to someday find out you're on foot. And I don't want to find out I'm on foot when I really need a horse. So I want to know he's got everything there that I need him to have. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. In Wyoming too. You don't want to be way out there without a good no. horse. <laughs> right. You, you out in the wild. You And I saw some of the babies that you have out there. They're just gorgeous. So I saw a little bit too on a program of yours um, that you were teaching one of your, it looked like maybe as an intern or a training under you, you were teaching a little bit about leading. And I love your philosophy about that horse partnering with you. I saw you correct this guy who was tugging a little bit on this baby and uh, you talked correctly. I thought about his eyes being averted from being able to look down at what he was trying to step over and uh, that he started to lock in a little bit. And you, you just said, not relax, give that horse his head, let him make a choice. And if he will partner with you, then it'll be a much happier learning experience for him. Talk a little bit about that philosophy. I think that's terrific. You know, that's a, um, it's a trait you see a lot in starting babies, but it really happens other places. When you're working with a weaning colt or even younger, a weaning foal or even down to three or four days old, you're, you're most of the time at a higher elevation. So when you pull on that halter and lead rope, it pulls on the bottom of their chin, elevates their nose, and now instead of looking at the ground where they'd want to walk, they're looking straight up in the sky. Yeah. And they're not comfortable. A horse doesn't have great depth perception anyways. Yeah. And they want to know where they're putting their feet. So when you start lifting their nose up, they're going to start setting down on their hocks and saying, no, I'm not going forward because I don't know where I'm going. Well, it's real obvious when it happens there. But really, if you want to if you want to break down trailer loading, that's where a lot of trailer loading falls apart, even with mature horses. You'll watch people, they step up in the trailer and they go to tugging or they run the rope through the side of the trailer and they go to tugging and they lift that horse's head up. Uh, and it's one of those things, there are so many pieces, Debbie, as you know, there are so many pieces of horsemanship that it's really not knowing the big things that matter. It's finding those little tiny pieces that make a difference in your horse's life because you're, you're seeing the world through his eyes. And if you take a minute to see what you're doing through his eyes, you'll frequently discover, boy, that was a mistake that I didn't know I was making. And, and it makes things so much harder for the horse. Uh, and you'll see it. You know, another example of that would be people that are struggling to take the correct lead. And say they're asking for the left-hand lead. And a lot of times they're so focused on it that they're staring at the left shoulder waiting to see the lead be evident in the shoulder and the whole time they're doing that they're putting all their body weight on the left side of the horse pushing to the right and of course he takes the right lead uh, which would be in that case incorrect and so so many things in horsemanship are like that where you know as you said earlier we don't have to discuss discipline we're discussing horsemanship and horsemanship really is more frequently about the little piece you're missing than it is the big piece you desire to learn yeah, well said. Well said. And and you were talking earlier about getting that horse into the muscle memory, doing a lot of wet saddle blankets basically to get a good horse. And and that points out the one of my favorite quotes is practice makes perfect, but not really. It's perfect practice that makes perfect because that's grinding right. grinding in something that's not working uh, just is not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. That's right. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Exactly. Exactly. So one one of my favorite things, I couldn't do this interview without asking you to describe, I hope you remember saying this at one point, but is what is your horse's bill of rights? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. Good. Um, the, the bill of rights to me for the horse is important. And it's almost more important for the owner than it is for the horse. Because your horse does have, uh, just like humans, he has certain inalienable rights. But they're not necessarily the same rights you might think that they are. Uh, your horse has the right to the most humane care possible, to the cleanest feed you can afford, 
to he has he has the right to have the safest environment you can afford to put him in. He does not, however, have the right to step on you. He does not, however, have the right to bite you. He does not have the right to kick you, buck you off, or run off with you. Those are things he doesn't have the right to do. <laughs> you have in, to tell in, him, though. <laughs> in, that's right. You, you have to teach him what his rights are, just like with people. If, if we were to take, if we were to go to a foreign country and, and find a tribe of people who absolutely were still living in a very uncivilized manner, if we brought those people to America and we did nothing to educate them and we just turned them loose on the street, um, who knows what they might do because they would not understand what their Bill of Rights were. Fortunately for us as Americans, we are educated on that from childhood on up. When we come to our horses, we frequently fail to teach them what their rights and, and what are rights and what aren't rights. Mm -hmm. And so you see people get drugged around by horses and stepped on by horses. And, and those people will frequently tell me, Ken, you're so patient. I'm not that patient. And I think to myself, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not patient because my horse isn't allowed to step on me. Yours has been stepping on you for 10 years. That's patient. <laughs> Because you've been allowing that for 10 years, and you've been hoping that he would someday learn that was the wrong thing, but you never took the time to teach him where it's okay to set, where it's okay to put his body, where it's okay to put his feet, whether it's okay to put his mouth on you or not. Mm -hmm. So I try to encourage my students to sit down and write out what it is acceptable for their horse to do. Years ago, I had a little appy horse, and I, I loved him to death. I was in high school. He defied all the rules of confirmation. He was a great little horse, but he, he did not have confirmation at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had all the try in the world. And so at the end of a hard day, he would come up to me, and when I'd turn him loose, and he would rub really hard on my shoulder with his head. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting deal. I, I eventually noticed that if I let him rub on my shoulder, I could catch him for work the next day. If I didn't let him rub on my shoulder, then there was no catching him the next day. <laughs> it, to him, it was a basic deal. And so for me, I never told him he didn't have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. I went ahead in my mind and I decided, you know what, he'd earned the right to scratch his head on my shoulder. So I tolerated that from him when I might not tolerate it from another horse because I felt like he had earned the right at that time. I could have at any time changed that and told him, no, you're no longer allowed to do that. From now on, you just have to be caught politely. But that was a, that was something that I accepted as purely bad behavior, but it was bad behavior that I, I like, I tolerated it much like, um, my dog jumping up on me when I walk out of the house <laughs> drives my wife absolutely up a wall. I never walk out of the house on Sunday morning wearing a dress that I'm worried about, but she does. <laughs> so Glad to hear. It's, it's much, the, yeah, it's, it's much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, we pick and choose what we like, but unfortunately some of what we allow is very dangerous to us. Mm -hmm. Your horse rubbing his nose on your shoulder, probably never going to get you hurt. Your horse nibbling on you, someday he's going to bite you. Yeah. You have to say, nope, these things you're not allowed to do. These aren't on your Bill of Rights, but you are allowed. You, you do have the right to good, humane care. You actually have the right to someone who loves you and is going to care for you. Uh, those, are, those are things, you know, um, our Bill of Rights says we have the right to the pursuit of happiness. Well, unfortunately, you know, the horse doesn't really quite get the pursuit of happiness, but he does have the right to all the things that would lead him to happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love that, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think a lot of people probably believe that but never verbalized it. And it's it's kind of fun to think about our horses having rights. Yeah, it is. It actually is. Yeah, and there's social animals too. And I like that you you emphasize and remind us of that a lot. So those Bill of Rights should take in that ability for them to be around other horses if at all possible, if we can. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I understand. I had a, a very, very good friend that lived in Southern California, and uh, he lived. He had a horse property, which meant that his backyard allowed him, as many Californians, to have two or three horses mm -hmm. uh, in his backyard. Um, well, they, those horses pretty much had to live in box stalls, and I understand 
that that was the way that has to be. But neither God nor horses ever invented the box stall. That's a man-made invention. And we make it for our convenience. And I'm very blessed. I, I live where my horses don't spend much time in box stalls. But I understand not everybody gets that. But as much as you can, right. even if it just means taking your horse and your friend's horse, putting them both in the round pen together, round pen them together for you know 10 or 15 minutes so you know they're not going to fight, and then walk away and leave them, even if they only get 20 or 30 minutes, they need that social interaction. They really do. And they'll get some of it from you. But they need just, you know, just like humans, you will occasionally find a human who really doesn't want to talk to another human. They would rather interact with an animal. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, no matter how much we say, well, I'd rather be around animals than humans, we really don't mean that. For the most part, we need that social interaction. Well, the horse is the same way. At some point during the day, you know, and maybe not necessarily every day, but at some point, they need that chance to run back and play with another horse and have fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we all, as good horse owners, like to at least get them out and get them to the mountains once in a while, to the beach or something, if we can do one of those plans. That's uh, that's the way to live, too. I, your mountains are calling me pretty strong, Ken. It looks pretty nice <laughs> out there. <laughs> oh, we have fun in the mountains. We, you know, uh, I know I'm blessed. We live in some of the prettiest country in the world, and, and we get to get on a horse and go and wake up and camp in the morning and know that there's no fences holding my horses to me. My horses are around camp and the nearest fence is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres away. And, and, and some of the camps we go to, there's millions of acres that are not fenced. And so, you know, I, that you should, you should come experience it, Debbie. That's what you need to do. You need to come out and just enjoy it. Well, I've got some friends that are Got a place up in Wyoming now, too. I'd love to make that trip. We go to Sun Valley, Idaho, and uh, go up in those white clouds, and we've been to the Sawtooth before and enjoy that, but I'm looking for a new spot, Ken. You do pack trips, too, right? Did, did I see some we do. photos of Yeah. Yeah, yeah we Soul. do. We have a really good time with that. We take <laughs> uh, folks up on horseback camping trips, and we have a good time. Every, you know, we stay in tents. It's pretty rustic living, but at the same time, you have – you have quite a bit of what you'd want at home. We have cots and, you know, you're not sleeping on the hard ground. We take pretty good care of everybody. And the big thing is we want people to just enjoy horses in the mountains and just have a good time. And it's, you know, it's one of those things we sit around the campfire in the morning, we sit around the campfire at night. And during the day we see lots of gorgeous country. Mm, that's great. I'm sold. Okay. So we're going to put up on the show notes where we can get a a hold of you guys and find your website and uh, we'd love to have you back sometime here some more about those mountains absolutely absolutely yeah, anytime i'd love it great thanks so much thanks for uh, agreeing to join us for the first premiere edition of ken McNabb on horsemanship radio and hope you won't be a stranger you'll come back again you bet i look forward to it thanks ken thank you ken yeah thank you both i appreciate it We all hear about omega-3 and how important it is for your horse's nutrition, but why? Well, simply put, horses were created to get all of their nutrition from live natural grasses. Omega-3 is an essential fat found in many types of live grasses, and it's critical to the horse's health. If they were living on live grasses 24-7, they would be receiving enough omega-3. But in today's world, most horses are fed commercial feed and forage as their primary nutrition, and most of these are lacking in omega-3. That's where Omega Fields comes in. All of Omega Fields' flax-based products provide a balanced essential profile of Omega-369 and may be helpful in alleviating problems related to skin, coat, hoof, joint, and sand colic. One of Omega Fields' terrific products is Omega Horse Shine. Omega Horse Shine is an Omega-3 stabilized ground flaxseed supplement for horses to help maintain a shiny, healthy coat, strong, solid hooves, and top performance for horses in all life stages. Omega Fields provides the best human-grade, non-GMO ground flax that can help horses with dry, scaly, itchy skin, joint pain and inflammation, poor hoof growth, allergies, and more. Don't just listen to Debbie and I. Alexandra, a customer of Omega Field, says any horse I ever own, I will feed them Omega Horse Shine, and I will recommend it to anyone. You can get your Omega Horse Shine today at OmegaFields.com. 
or just for our listeners, get 15% off using the coupon code MONTY2015. All one word, it's MONTY2015 for 15% off your next order at OmegaFields.com. That's OmegaFields.com. Heather Moffat began riding as a young child in the UK, in the United Kingdom, but in her early years, she was questioning the methods being used to teach. By the age of 16, she had developed a different method of teaching and riding, especially how to synchronize exactly with the movement of the horse. This enabled her to teach beginners at age 16 with extraordinary speed and also to rectify long-established faults in experienced riders. More than 20 years ago, she pioneered the teaching of riding with the equisimulators. Those are those machines which simulate the movement of a horse. And it enables you to have very precise hands-on teaching in total safety, successfully teaching hundreds of riders all over the world. She is the founder of Enlightened Equitation. I've had the honor today to sit down and join Heather Moffat of the Enlightened Equitation and Monty Roberts from Join Up International that happened to be both teaching and demonstrating at the annual Monty Roberts Certified Instructors Conference. And I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to pull these two um, very long uh, and experienced, long-lived and experienced horsemen to uh, Horsemanship Radio and get your opinion of what horsemanship is doing out there in the world today and where you might be able to take it um, with the the crop that you saw today of instructors mm-hmm. that are good students, obviously traveled from many parts of the world just yeah. to come and hear you talk. Mm. So I'd like to introduce Heather Moffat and Monty Roberts. And Heather, we'd love to hear from you first. Well, it's been an honor to be here today. And uh, it's was particularly my instructor's who are also Monty's instructors as well. I have two fully qualified ones um, and one who currently, well, she went off to have a baby, so she's hoping to come back and finish her in light degradation teaching training. Mm. And the nice thing is that I feel that the groundwork in particular that Monty does works very well for us. It then leads on very nicely to our classical in-hand and long-reigning training. And then it still applies considerably to the the written work that we do although that is very much my genre it still has come from the fact that horses have been given the the education on the ground first which makes them much easier to ride at a later date so yeah it was really good to be able to come and talk to the students and I think we got a I got a really good reception from them there seemed to be a lot of interest Mm -hmm. and it was really nice that Monty liked what I was saying as well so over to Monty. Very much. I think there was a lot of common ground. Yeah, <clears throat> there was, Debbie. And um, we're here in Oxfordshire, in England. Right. And we've come across the Atlantic this time for the first time with the conference uh, to get closer to the center of mm. our instructors' core, right. if you will. We have about 80 instructors now. But there's about 24 or so here at the moment. Um, and Heather is absolutely right that uh, our disciplines are vastly different when you're in the saddle. Mm-hmm. But we still deal with horses. Mm-hmm. There's a leg on each corner. There's a head mm-hmm. out front. And a wonderful brain in there somewhere. Yep. Um, a set of muscles and nerves that um, deserve our attention, and deserve our attempt to meet their needs Mm -hmm. and to cause them to be partners with us. And I've discovered today that Heather Moffat feels the same way. Yes, absolutely. Um, While while the saddle may be in a slightly different place, the rider may sit a different way than, let's say, the Western, Mm -hmm. and certainly different from the jockeys and the show Mm -hmm. jumpers and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But um, I think that the, the similarities far outweigh the yeah, differences absolutely. when you come to the psychological effort that we have mm. to try to create partners mm. with these yeah. wonderful things called horses. Um, and it seems to me that too many of our uh, elite horse people mm-hmm. globally 
want to differentiate too much yeah. these disciplines. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's okay for him, but, you know, I have to da-da-da-da-da. Well, that's not good enough. It really isn't. And it is okay for me to do this or that. And it is okay for somebody else to do something quite different. But down the middle somewhere mm -hmm. is this understanding mm. that these horses, not one single one of them mean harm to yeah. us. Sure. They mean not to do anything wrong. We just have to show them what it is that we want, be mm. fair with them, treat them in an incremental fashion, not just throw things yeah. at them and expect them to know instantly what we expect. Mm -hmm. um, and I've found a, a partner here who feels the same way, mm. who's in a vastly different discipline than yeah. I'm in. Mm. If you went, Debbie, to the guys that I showed Western horses with in the 40s and Back 50s. Back in the day, mm. yeah. And said, I found a lady that does classical horsemanship. They wouldn't know what the heck I'm talking oh, yeah. about. Yeah, good point. Wouldn't mm. have a clue. Mm. What they would think is Spanish riding school. Right. What yeah. they would mm -hmm. think is those horses that went to Hungary and then came back to Vienna. Ah, like the Lipizzaners. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. everybody's whipping on them and tying them between two posts. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Capriole is the Good. end all. Mm -hmm. That's what they would think classical mm -hmm. riding is. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know how I know that? You saw it. I thought the same thing oh, for a, large, the same thing. Okay, a yeah. large part of my life. Right. Yeah. We never had dressage horses in, in California when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, art something brought uh, the first dressage horses to California. Wow. And funny enough, he, he was a TV star, movie star. And um, he had me taking care of them at the horse shows. I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and he had a lot of things to do and stay busy. And so he left his horses with me and I exercised them and, and fed them and mucked out and the whole thing and along with my horses. Mm -hmm. But, um, it was amazing what he did with these horses. He went to Germany and bought two nice, mm -hmm. um, dressage horses and brought them over there mm -hmm. and he took some lessons and he learned, and this thing called Piaf and Passage, mm -hmm was beautiful you know so i learned to value and yeah. appreciate yeah. dressage before anybody in california knew yeah, what, what the it, heck was. it was yeah um so it's come a long way and while i'm 81 it's a short lifetime you know mm -hmm. it is yes and yeah. uh, i was saying to it's a generation uh, yeah i was mm -hmm. saying to heather today that um it hasn't been that long ago that I was winning world championships all through the fifties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, um, and I said to Heather that my performances in those days mm -hmm. wouldn't win third today in a County show mm -hmm. somewhere. They've improved. The that level much. has come up that way. Yeah. And I'm so proud of what I've been able to do. We recently discovered that we have five of my students in the top 25 yeah. Western yeah. riders in, yeah. in the world. Um, There's a lot of That's riders just there. crazy. Yeah, that is you crazy. Know? It, it's really crazy. But but we're leading the movement mm -hmm. to be fair with our horses. Yeah. And I know yeah. that Heather is a fan of that. Well, what, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Heather, what did you demonstrate today with Tessa Horan? I know you had her yeah. up. What were you demonstrating to this group? Well, basically how the rider interacts with the horse, because that is the biggest thing that's left out in teaching the rider is how to synchronize their movements with those of the horse. You know, they're told, sit deeper, relax your back, go with the movement, follow the movement. All of that means nothing to a beginner rider. So if you tell them sit deeper, they crush themselves down into <laughs> the saddle, tell them to relax your back, then they go like a jelly on a plate. Um, and they don't ever learn to, to actually move in sync with the horse, which is the secret, apart from anything else, of any riding, never mind classical, whether it's Western or whatever, because I used to watch cowboy films when I was a kid, as I said to the students and Monty earlier on. And because the, even though they were going over an incredibly rough terrain, they appear to be really glued to the saddle. They came wasn't always the most stylish performance, but they were just quiet in the saddle and mm -hmm. their seats just remained totally in, in sync with the horse. Yeah. What were they doing that I wasn't? So I went off out and experimented on my horses 
until such one day I suddenly realised that whatever I was doing, I was completely joined with the movement. And so then I had to set about analysing what I was doing so I could then pass it on to other people. And I never forget then when I sort of was actually, I went to try a horse and it was at a dealer's yard back in Essex and I was doing some show jumping at the time rather than the dressage. And the chairman of the British Show Jumping Association's wife was actually trying a horse at the time. And I had learned to sit very, very still in canter so that I didn't appear to be doing anything. Mm. And she said to my father, I think I was 15 or 16 at the time, he said, um, who's taught her to ride, you know, sit so still in canter? And she he said, oh, she's been watching cowboy films. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, that was, and she said, well, can she teach me? Mm. So this 15-year-old then set about teaching at that lesson, it, was, it wasn't a lesson, it was a, a dealer's yard. Mm. She was trying a horse, I was trying another horse. Mm. And she said, "Would you? can you try to teach me? Mm. Well, prior to that, I was online for, for a scientific career. And I suddenly thought, hang on, do you know something? I think I was meant to do this. Mm. Because I managed to teach her to sit much more still in the canter. That must have been and exciting. So, yeah, it that was. And yeah. so I have never done anything else since then. I've only ever, I've only ever worked for myself, which is probably a very bad thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've had some very good trainers along the way who have helped me enormously yeah. to improve, and in particular, the refinement of the aids. Mm. It was me that worked out how to absorb the movement. But it was Captain Desiderant, who was um, a student of Nuno Oliveira in Portugal, a great Portuguese master, and then subsequently a German-trained trainer who'd grown up in Germany, which is English, um, Dr. Margaret Cox. And then I went on to um, Mestre Luis Valencia uh, Rodriguez in Portugal, mm. who is Nuno Oliveira's, his wife's Nuno, was Nuno Oliveira's cousin, because Nuno's dead, of course. Um, and between those three... I sort of formulated my own system of writing, which became Enlightened Equitation. Um, I was asked to write a series of articles for a magazine years ago now. Uh, it's my first ever series, in fact. And um, the layout editor said to me, what do you want to call it? And completely without even thinking, I said, Enlightened Equitation, because that's what I was looking for, was mm. to enlighten people. Mm. And over the years, you know, I mean, the original book sold over 60,000 copies. So... It has actually enlightened quite a few people, yeah, but I go. still feel that the message hasn't been able to get out to as many people mm. because I know that, you know, Monty's instructors and Kelly's and whatever else wouldn't have anywhere near as many horses to, to mend if they actually, the riders were not causing them to be so blocked in their it, movement. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we follow the the intelligent, well, we follow the intelligent horsemanship groundwork stuff as well as Monty's. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's all very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, uh, you know, because, and it, it just works very well. But it would be nice if so many of the instructors weren't having to solve problem horses mm -hmm. and they could actually get on with the groundwork to train the horse to progress mm -hmm. and then go on to what we're doing mm -hmm. to train the horse to whichever discipline in, in dressage or show jumping, eventing, obviously mm -hmm. the classical work works for that, or for Western riding, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so you were able to expose a little bit of your teaching. You actually mm -hmm. had Tessa Horan out there on yeah. top of Boo, yeah. your horse. One of and, my Lusitanos, uh, yeah. And Lusitano. And um, I'm wondering if you've ever been in the round pin and done a join-up, or if yeah. Monty could... Oh, you yeah, have? I have. Yeah, 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 I've done it. In fact, I, would, I did join up with my uh, PRE stallion when he arrived in December. And the only thing is, we haven't got a round pen. I have to square off the end of my smaller indoor school. Oh, you can help job. her with that. Oh, yeah. Right. What, what would she do job. if she doesn't... Yeah, you just square so, it off. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we've done, you know, um, and Kay, who's my yard manager, she, she's done quite a lot of join-up work and whatnot with Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we've, we've used the join-up work and uh, just about everything else, the loading techniques, everything we've always Excellent. used. Um, and the funny thing is uh, we've got two people who sometimes actually come to us who use a horse box transport you know, person who has their own transport mm -hmm. And those two people are the only two people I know that can't get their own horses into oh, the great. box. So, okay, my yard manager ends up putting their horses in the box. Okay. And these are the actual horse transport company owners. So, oh, okay. And that's all come about via your methods. Okay. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it all works very well. Together. Well, that's yeah, that's what we're hearing today is that there's common ground here, not just in the so. saddle and on the ground. It's not as simple as that, I and don't think. And it should be that way, Debbie, with, with every... Uh, trainer on earth yeah. Yeah. that we have common ground Should because yeah. we have a common 
animal that we would deal with. Yeah. And yes, there are differences in our breeds, et cetera, and our uses of those breeds. Mm. But the similarities far outweigh the differences. Absolutely. And we could all learn from one another. There's yeah. these little things. Um, we had a session this morning about the new things people have learned. And a lot of things came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the into pressure things that we learned this morning, um, some brand new things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I, I'm excited about it. And, and it's, it is exciting to hear that Heather was inspired by a bunch of cowboys riding in Western yeah, movies. Yeah, great, yeah. But that you know, in the foreword to my book. <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing about that is that uh, those stars that she met, they couldn't ride one side of a horse. No, they you couldn't. Know? Yeah. And we had to lead the them X-Files. around. Oh, yeah. My, my, I'll my, bet. My father uh, rented me out mm. as a stunt rider yeah. from four years onward mm. because kid and horse movies were the whole thing oh, during yeah. the 40s. Yeah. And so I was a kid stunt person so like all through the double. 40s. Yeah. yeah. And we could ride. Mm. I mean, all the you kids better, around right? me could yeah. ride, and the yeah. men around me could ride, real riders. Mm. But we had to lead the stars, mm-hmm. and the camera was yeah. in close, just on them. Mm-hmm. And then they would stop, and then when you're running over the mountain and down through the valley and across <laughs> oh, the yeah. river, it was a That's real rider. the ones Heather the ones, yeah. the ones exactly, yeah. not and the stars. I, I, yeah. I did so many Roddy McDowell mm-hmm. movies. Really? And, yeah, I was yeah. his uh, stunt double uh, all the way through. Uh, yeah. he was, I was the only one that they would use for, for Roddy McDowell. So, uh, yeah, and I, I even uh, did Liz Taylor. Oh, wow. Point, <laughs> with a wig on and, yeah. and a funny little hat and stuff. He was a Brit for a minute. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I was a Brit and uh, a, a female Brit. Right, and, yeah. even. And, uh, <laughs> that was uh, for the incredibly famous movie um, um, called what? National Velvet. Yes. National yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You're going to that. Velvet. Gosh, I'm going to see that was, again in the same light. Well, well yeah. she, was, right. she was injured the first day of shooting. Um, and broke an ankle and hurt her back and complained of uh, pain in those areas till the day she mm, died. Right. And it was really strange that um, uh, I was in Brazil when, the day she died, and I woke up and CNN was the only uh, mm-hmm. English-speaking channel, and I had it on, and I see myself going across the screen <laughs> in the well, water. I knew the, I, knew, I knew the scene, mm-hmm. you know? yeah. and it was to announce that uh, this is... Liz Taylor, and she died. <laughs> Nobody today. notified you that you died. Nobody told me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was quite a surprise. Mm-hmm. But um, there were a lot of good riders in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'm Some that went on and won many world championships mm-hmm. uh, in, in various uh, riding events, Western kind yeah, of riding absolutely. events. But, um, but the, the stars themselves, very few of them could ride. Well, uh, I Joel cringe McCray sometimes, you know, when I see the, the, you know, sort of historical dramas here, for instance, and mm-hmm. even then, you know, some of the stars insist on riding and mm-hmm. they're crashing around in the saddle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those poor <laughs> horses. Why, why don't they send them to me to learn to ride, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, very, you've written a book for us, so tell yeah. us the name of the book. Enlightened equitation, That's which great. is the same as, the, uh, as everything else, yes, yeah. and I've revised it actually because the original one came out in 1998, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I didn't feel the need to actually write another book um, because I hadn't really altered anything that I'd put in the original book. I just needed to add to it good. because I'd Expanded. learned more. That's good from yeah. that time, and so of course I added another 500 all new photographs, many of them in sequence. What we did was actually at a clinic was to shoot sequence shots of things going wrong mm. and then some more sequence shots showing how I'm putting it right mm. with the necessary captions, etc. So it's good. really good. pictorial. It's for me, a picture's often worth a thousand words, as they say. Yeah. Um, so, so, but that, I, that's I do one want way to that. write another one, you know, sort of on French equitation in particular. Right. But uh, I'm not one of these people because I do see some writers, people that... I know as well sometimes who regurgitate their books in just slightly different form and then put a different title on it. But I can't do that. You know, what I've learnt over the years is still serving me well now and it works with virtually any horse, which is why I never think twice about getting on one at a demonstration on the other side of the world because mm. I know it will respond to the AIDS. Mm. So, well, I'm, I'm working on my second autobiography my first autobiography was uh, the last entry was in 1991. Yeah. 
And I submit to you that more has happened to me since oh, 1991 yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, than before 1991. I read the first one. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I'm going to add, add to that one. Absolutely. And, and also the first one was whitewashed a lot, then cut back. Mm. And I, I want to tell it the way it really, it really was. was. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so that's going to be fun. Mm. And uh, so we, I, I've just recently heard Heather say that the next time I'm over, She's inviting me to come and uh, really get into the you know what you'd the minutia Debbie as well uh, <laughs> thank of, you of of her work so mm. that'll be fun to that'll do. be fun for it we'll have great. to do a follow up interview that'll then on that day yeah, too it's a, it's a beautiful place it's it, South Devon so thank um, you yeah. thank you that's a It'd wonderful be, invitation you know, be very welcome to come down. I was so, in Dorset just a few days yeah, ago. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, yes, I haven't been able to come to any of the demos this time, but uh, we had I've certainly enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah, they're at um, Dorset. Was, was it great. Kingston Moorwood that you it were was, yeah. yeah, I was I was there with Kelly when she did one there. Okay. Um, Beautiful but, building. Uh, yeah, it is a good building. Mm-hmm. The last one I came to yours was at The Hand. And, of okay. course, that's no longer with us, unfortunately. No, that's been no. Sold the off because that gone. was a good one. Towerlands is gone. Oh, Towerlands. Yeah. I saw you Way first at Towerlands many years ago. Yeah. What's the one in Scotland? Yeah. They've stopped and, uh, yeah. Glen Eagles? Is Glen, Glen Eagles, Glen Eagles oh, no. is really? gone. Yeah. No. They put four tennis courts oh, my in goodness. that beautiful building. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. That is, I didn't realize Glen mm. Eagles We're going to have to fight for our equestrian centers to stay alive here. That's yeah. crazy mm-hmm. because yeah. the thing is, you know, you go to Germany and Holland and they've yeah, got indoor schools in virtually every village never yeah. mind towns yeah. and it's it's so difficult to get planning permission to build indoor mm. schools here and well, I it's think almost riding all is still, colleges now isn't it yeah. oh and t- well take it from me i have 18 students coming up from the dutchy college in cornwall and you know i'm not afraid to be saying this you know the standard of riding there i was in there in november i was absolutely horrified yeah, that's the thing. and that's the next generation that they're releasing mm. onto mm. the public as instructors and whatnot and the mm. colleges have got a lot to answer for as far as i'm concerned mm. they're churning them out like sausages really they are and you know I, I think it's a great shame that the you know the young ones are not getting the education that they should but it's nice at least that they're bringing them up to me mm-hmm. to do a demonstration. Yeah. And I'm hoping that it'll inspire some of them to want to yeah. improve. But my working student over the summer, she came to me um, over the summer. She was like in the college break. She refused to go back to do the second year oh. after she'd been with me for three mm-hmm. months. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's it's I think that. If we can get a combined message across mm. that, you know, mm. we are all singing from the same hymn sheet and that. As long We're as you're advocating for the, for the, horse, the horse, that's it. You know? yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, the more that we can put it across to all the different disciplines, the, the better it can possibly be. So yeah. I'm very pleased, as I said, to have been invited here today. And, uh, and thank Monty and the, the yeah, students. We've been for... almost a half an hour, Debbie. And yeah. I, ju- I just want to <laughs> tell your audience that I'm really wrestling the world to try to get the standards of each discipline Absolutely. that we work in to be more compatible yeah. with the horse meeting the horse's needs as opposed to flim flam high action and speed and all of that mm-hmm. stuff but to to make it beautiful and to make it harmonious to get the basics right yeah. you know the mm-hmm. foundations right yeah. and to instill into people right from the word go that the horse is a living sentient being exactly and not a four-legged bicycle yeah you know? and i think good. that is the trouble that's, that's right. good that, you know the horse is mute he can't cry out like a dog yeah, and that has been his downfall throughout history. Mm. And I think if we can make people aware of that and to treat him with the respect that he deserves, then you know, our lives won't have been in vain, Monty. Mm, that's, that's right. So, that's You've right. heard it straight from the people who deal with the horse's <laughs> I mouth. I think it's the horse's mouth, both of you here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's the horses yeah. are speaking. We just have to listen. Yeah, yeah. we have Absolutely. to know how to listen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for today. It's my thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place and learn the magic in the language of the herd. Dear Monty, I remember someone I knew said that if a horse doesn't want to back up and hand on a lead rope, the way to encourage them is to use an 18 to 24 inch riding crop 
and whip their legs. I also observed this technique in a horse training video. I don't remember who the trainer was, though. I have always had great admiration for your work and mission to make the world a better place for horses than you found it. Monty's response. What you have described here regarding recommendations for teaching a horse to back up is absolutely the opposite of my concepts. When a horse is whipped across the legs to get it to back up, it will usually work. But when the horse does move back, it is angry. And wouldn't you be? Whipping the horse and producing pain in order to achieve any given goal is wrong when you deal in the concepts of Monty Roberts. The method you have described also takes longer than my method and produces a horse that will receive lower marks in competition for exhibiting anger while backing up. Use of a whip will also generally encourage tail swishing and certainly putting the ears back. Please do not accept this recommendation. It is not only unfair and brutal, but it is not very effective when attempting to achieve acceptable performance. The first day that I work with a horse, I ask for a step or two in reverse. When I get it, I release the lines and congratulate the horse with a rub. They will learn very quickly that backing up is a good thing to do and there is no whip required. If I inherit a horse that has already developed a resistance to backing up, then I use a narrow hallway or chute, ride the horse into it, ask him to back up, and watch him learn as he backs out. From My Hands to Yours, my textbook, has a chapter on backing up with drawings to illustrate my recommendations. I recommend that you read that chapter if you want to achieve acceptable backing up from your horse. The next time anyone suggests that you whip a horse in order to achieve any goal whatsoever, please just tell them that that procedure is not necessary and that you have better ways to deal with your equine partner. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says Get Free Horse Tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in May. May 5th, he'll be in Austria, then May 7th, and then he'll hop down to South Africa. On May 28 and 29, he'll be in Johannesburg, and in June 4 and 5, he'll be in Cape Town. And so will I. It'll be really exciting. Maybe we'll get some uh, interviews down there. Then July 17 through 21, there's a Monty special training with a translation in Portuguese as well, and that's at Flag is Up Farms in California. And then August 1st through 5th in 2016, it'll be Monty special training at Flag is Up Farms for the full week. And then we've got August 22 through September 2, is the one that Jamie Jennings took, the Gentling Wild Horses course at Flag is Up Farms. We've got some great horses lined up for that too. Really fun. And then September 9, Horse Sense for Leaders. Uh, that uh, follows right by a weekend of Wild at Heart with Pat Roberts. And Monty will be there too. That's September 10 and 11. And you can see all of this at Monty Roberts' website, montyroberts.com. Or you can go old school and talk to a real honest-to-goodness human being and know, who knows exactly what's going on at Flag is Up Farms by calling 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, you can go to horsemanshipradio.com where we'll have links to our guests, photos, and lots more information. And we love your feedback. It helps us make this show great. So please mm-hmm. follow us on Facebook at Monty Roberts. And on Twitter, yep, Monty Tweets. You can go to Monty underscore Roberts. And don't forget, you can get the Horse Radio Network app. It's for your iPhone or Android, and it's free. You can listen to all of your favorite Horse Radio Network shows, including Horsemanship Radio. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network, or you can subscribe via iTunes. 
Yes, and many thanks to our sponsors, IFA.com, Omega Fields, and Monty's Equus Online University. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 